This video has been made possible through the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. Please subscribe to follow us here on YouTube and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation and tonight's Tuesday Tech Talk featuring Todd Cahill, um, who's got a business in this uh, very Francis Cabot Lowell Mill called Steam Machine Sculpture. So this particular program is about the belt and pulley line shaft system, which you saw shutting down as we uh, entered the frame. And uh, Todd actually, as a machinist, as an artist, as a really superior craftsperson, has um, made good use of a belt and pulley line shaft system in his own shop, and he knows as much about it as anybody we know. And uh, uh, I spent uh, over an hour with him last week recording him um, explaining how line shafts work, explaining how uh, uh, they were used in the past and how they uh, came about, came to become the, uh, uh, the motive force behind machine tools of the 19th century and so forth, but um, he's a great storyteller. At the end of that video, we're gonna return to the museum and Todd is going to give us a tour, a brief tour of our own machine shop, uh, which has a belt and pulley line shaft system uh, that functions very well. You're in for a treat. Welcome. I, I studied, uh, um, which a lot of budding engineers and, and mechanicians of the day would have, would have studied o Oliver Evans' book, um, The Young Millwright's Guide. And he was an American in the Philadelphia area um, who, was, who developed the, the system of, um, for grist mills of bringing everything to the highest point of the mill and letting it fall through the mill as stuff was happening to, you know, as this run through the stones and the sifters and, and going through the elevators and stuff like that. So at the end, it would end up in a delivery wagon, you know, um, at the ground floor. Um, but he, he, a lot of millwrights would have, would have followed his kind of um, uh, examples. And he used a little bit, of, I think what Francis, or what, what Paul Moody did, proposed was to use the the leather belts and before that I believe in England I mean they, there would have been belting on a limited scale but they would have used ropes coming off of the main or just go directly to using cogs so there would be gearing on the end of the shafting either going down you know there'd be miter gears going down or there would be gearing to transfer power from one shaft to the other, you know? Um, and that, so that was all like cast iron gearing. I must have made a racket. I mean, this is loud enough. Um, so I, I think given that he was in America where there was a lot more wood, I mean, you could use wood, and they did in England, but also the leather and, and and that was quite an investment, and uh, to use that much leather in a in a belt, and how do you join it? How do you you know do all the things that that I talked about, and to treat the leather so that it it's going to uh, stay pliable, you know, is uh, was was quite a feat. But I think that's what his kind of um, contribution, one of the contributions was to use the, the belts and the pulleys, you know, as your main uh, line shaft uh, uh, power source. Um, I always look in these buildings here, like, like this, this building, this line shaft could be the most line shaft this building has ever had because it was, this building was from 1890. And I don't, there is, next door there is some line shafting, but I think it was for an elevator. And they did that, that the Oliver Ev Evans thing of like, because this was the finishing building in this mill. And so it was finishing and packing. 
and so they probably would have lift product up and it would have would have gone through the floors as the various processes of of having the stuff finished was done to it and then it was you know processed through the counting house and out to the store you know so in in england they used to use a uh, they 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 didn't use leather belts so much um, they use rope in, in England to transmit the power. So they would weave, you know, uh, bands of rope together. And you could actually get a lot of torque out of rope in like a, a small little V, v groove uh, pulley. So that's, a, that's the half of a flywheel in a mill. Um, the other half is below ground. So you're seeing the center line of that right there. And those are all ropes. Have a hard time stopping that. This is a, a, a depiction or is derived from a, a photograph of an engine in Paisley, Scotland that ran a, a thread mill at the J.P. Coates, which became Coates and Clark, which is still a very big um, embroidery thread um, was there was their main concern, um, but uh, they did a lot of, there were a lot of textiles in, in, in Scotland and Paisley, Scotland. Um, but this, anyway, this engine ran a, a mill there. Um, it was probably, I think this was in the back of the, of the, of the mill, and this would have been a T going off like this in, in, in that this was powering. So there'd be machinery on both ends of, of this, where this uh, uh, power transmission is coming in. Um, so I started out with a small draw, or a small photograph and kind of expanded on that and added a lot of uh, kind of things or, or there's a lot of conjecture and artistic license in my depiction. Bob asked me where I should begin talking about this, and it's probably where uh, a lot of mechanics servicing mills began their day with uh, oiling all the journals and the bearings and so forth. And, and there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of miles of line shafting in these, in these mills. And with this motor that I have powering mine, it's especially important to get some oil in there because this motor spent its whole life um, upside down and it was hung from the rafters in a mill that I had uh, reclaimed this, some of this stuff from and uh, so now in the situation that it is in my shop it's actually upside right it's standing as it should but but after how many years 80 years of running a line shaft somewhere it, it became acclimated to being upside down. So now it's, it's a pretty, uh, I'll say a loose motor. Um, it, it, the, the bearings are, are, are not very precision anymore, but so I like to get oil to them. Um, and in, in the case of uh, my line shafting, I don't really put it to much use. And so I might be three times a year four times a year that I run it. So, I mean, the oil kind of sticks around and it's not super important, but um, it's good to keep up proper maintenance. <laughs> I've been in, in mills that uh, had uh, line shaft ladders and it was just a straight shot extension ladder. Mm -hmm. It was just an, ex it didn't really extend, but it had two hooks on the end and they would hook the ladder directly up to the line shaft and let it hang on there and they could climb up and, and do all that stuff. Most of this, this equipment came from various mills um, and sometimes the machinery was not part of their transmission uh, source. You know, um, you have, you have your, your main line shaft here and um, this, is, this whole part here is both to slow down the motor um, the, the output speed of the motor and to also increase torque and so and, it, and you also um, uh, b 
build up momentum. There's a lot of momentum in line shafts so that, especially with equipment that, that was, that had either a hard start or in the case of um, reciprocating machines, there's always that impact when it starts the cut that you didn't want it bogging down. So if you had enough momentum in your line shaft, it's not going to be affected by any work that it has to do or impact of work, high impact. Um, that's one of the reasons why, you know, weight, you think of all the weight of, of the pulleys and the belts and the, and the, the, um, the shafting. Um, and it, it, uh, it's like they haven't even gotten to what they're trying to do yet. And they got to get all that moving. But once you get it moving, it's hard to stop that moving, you know? Um, so it, but in this case, I have a motor that's a relative, it was probably always for a line shaft. Um, and um, they run at 1750 RPM. So you have to get that speed down if you weren't relying on a river or a steam engine that also performs better at, at a high speed, you know? But in this case, the motor here, I like to soft start it. Um, so, tell us about the stop starting. Uh, well, I just like to make sure that everything's going to, you know, that I didn't miss something or that a pulley is, a belt is going to go off. Um, so that's just my, my habit, I guess. Um, so what it comes from the motor to, to this here and then back to here and you have two increases in, in, in uh, speed but you also have that increase in torque. So, and the, the width of the, the belt is, is a, is a um, uh, sign of how much torque that is. It's hard to stop a really wide belt going around a pulley like that, you know? If this was a real operation, you know, I'd have some standard sizes of pulleys and um, even with all the stuff that I've, that I've collected, you know, sometimes you're still got a mismatch of a mix match of, of items that you just can't work with. You want that speed, but it's, it's the wrong shaft diameter or whatever, you know, but you're not um, a production house making no, thousand widgets. no, you're, uh, no doing custom bespoke work. Yeah. Of a kind thing. So mm -hmm. you don't need to adhere to any standards. Right, right, right. Well, I can't. Because they don't sell this stuff anymore. <laughs> this was my first kind of uh, uh, one of the first kind of kinetic pieces that I made in college, and really, it's it consists of uh, there's a motor in there. There's a transmission here that does exactly what my, my line shaft system does, which is slow down that motor, but also increase the torque because you want to be able to spin the top, you know. Um, so this is starting out fast here, and it's getting progressively slower as we go. And it's also, you know, kind of um, out. <laughs> it's increasing the torque too. Yes. It, you can't stop it with a finger, you know. It's interesting. I think I li I definitely like uh, um, installing rather than deinstalling equipment. Although you have the gravity works with you when you're pulling equipment out, <laughs> um, and but but. Usually it's in pretty harsh environments. I was at one was in Scarborough, Maine in the dead of winter in an unheated shop and we had made an offer for the whole, for whatever they had left in this building because they were selling it. And uh, that was two days of, of pulling, pulling stuff out of that. In the, uh, it was so cold and, so, and everything is heavy. And uh, um, I remember, I can show you the motor outside, that, that was the last thing I insisted on taking. To this day, I still don't know why. <laughs> but I was cutting the, the support 
that had held this motor up against a, a column. Um, it had probably been there for 110 years, you know. Um, and there I am after we had chained it through the ceiling up above and kind of supported it so it doesn't fall on me. But I'm removing the very same structure that's supporting this thing over me. And when I made it through the last cut, it kind of dropped about an inch because it stretched the chain or the, the, the uh, straps and just kind of dangled there. And then we were able to lower it down from there. But um, no. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, that was, that was, uh, um, you, you should acquire it while you're young and then get rid of it when you're old, right? <laughs> um, but I, it, was, it was interesting to, to have to install this stuff and I, I have uh, pictures of it. I can, I can include those of, of me installing this oh, with chain falls. And um, so that, that's um, like around here is just some of the equipment that I use to, to take stuff out. So you have chain falls and uh, come alongs and winches and a whole bunch of strapping and you never know what you're gonna, gonna need in a situation. Um, and, uh, there ain't many people that tell you how to do it either, you know? Um, and it's, uh, and there isn't as much of it out there anymore, you know? When I go into a place to buy out all their, their line shaft, you, you want to take as much as you can because you never know what you're going to need because you're designing it around something that isn't... That's, uh, how would you put that? That's unique. That's unique. That's not like you can't order this stuff out of a catalog right. anymore. So I, I, I always took as much as I could out of these places. So you can see all the, the bearings up there. There's spare pulleys. There's spare pulleys back there. Um, there's a lot of iron pulleys and uh, kind of uh, pressed metal like a, or um, uh, formed steel pulleys um, they uh, and and there's shafting down here there's lengths of probably 12 foot 13 foot length of shafting down below here um, and all kinds of transmission um, pieces and stuff like that and none of it is lightweight do you ever worry that this floor won't support all you ask of it? That's why I hang stuff from the ceiling. <laughs> Use their floor. <laughs> yeah. Before I came here, I was in a, in a mill building, wooden mill building out in Central Mass. And my landlord was a great guy, but he came to me. I was two stories up and uh, had all kinds of machinery that I had hoisted up the stairs. But he came to me one day. He's like, Todd, I want you to come for a walk with me. So he takes me outside and he... And he brings me alongside his building and he's like, he says, you see how my building is kind of tilted? <laughs> I said, no, I don't see it, Bob. <laughs> so the, the pulleys in here, um, what might have been more common in, in say, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell's time when he first started this mill would be the wooden pulleys. So there was plenty of wood around and, and really... It didn't, because there were no machinists, you wouldn't have a machinist put that together. You would hire a woodworker or, or a blacksmith. So a lot of the pieces like that are either cast or, uh, or forged and cut and turned on a, on a, you know, on a wood lathe. Um, so there, and then there's the line shaft parts and, um, uh, or, or the, I should say the, uh, the bearings that they ride in. And those come in all, you know, shapes and sizes. Some of the things I've discovered with, with the pulleys and stuff is that um, they made the center holes of pulleys all this, a standard. And the shafting was often different. Um, so you'd have to you'd use these blocks, in some cases wooden, or in some cases iron, to get you from the standard bore of a pulley to... Um, to, to go around whatever shafting you're using throughout. I would imagine that shafting starts really big at the source 
at the you know at the power source at the water wheel or the turbine or the steam engine it and it gets pro pro yeah and it gets progressively smaller as you're reaching the far ends of the mill from the from the main power source um, so you would make up your your uh, your 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 shafting sizes with those those blocks and that's where you were saying with the uh, the crown pulleys and that's how you you keep it on the pulley is that the, the 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 rim of the pulley is crowned so that belt is always going to seek that point you would think it wants to fall off but it actually wants to be tight the belt does and also the weight of it makes it track on that in fact that belt right there, I talked about those wooden plugs. In, so this belt going to that smaller pulley there, that belt will actually steer that pulley. It will pull that off of those wooden plugs because those were the, I had to make those and I didn't get them exact to the outer and inner diameter of what I was shooting for. So that pulley will actually, it'll pull off of those plugs. It's clamped pretty tightly. But the, because of the way the belt wants to track on that, it'll pull that pulley off rather than fall off the pulley. You come about problems and you solve things in different ways and sometimes you'll go down a rabbit hole of trying to solve something and often it's uh, Occam's razor, is that it? Occam. Occam. Occam's. Occam's razor. The simplest solution is the best solution, right? Or the, um, but this, I always point out this stick because this belt kept kept tracking off of the pulley and what I meant you know with that old, old acclimation of I didn't know how to you know I kept moving this up and down and you have some some freedom to kind of move the shaft but in some cases you're you're stuck so that's where this comes from and it will probably never bite its way through that piece of wood um, but it, it keeps it on there, and that was the, the easiest way to do that, you know. <laughs> a stick. <laughs> and I always like to have a, it's always handy to have a stick around if you need to nudge a, nudge a, 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 a belt onto its pulley or, you know, line something up or... A stick always comes in handy. And whenever I started, I was, before you came, I said, ah, and I used to have a regular stick around here, but I think I built it into something. So <laughs> what we have here is a, you have a shaper and a, a, a vertical shaper or a slaughter. So these are all uh, operate on, with a single point tool. You can see it just taking a shave off and then it, it indexes over and it does its next pass. Um, hardly working them at all. This one here is a, is a slaughter. And um, that would be used to make, you know, um, kind of keyways like that in a piece of metal or to, to drive a pulley. So you would have a cutter that comes down and sneaks in there and cuts it back and forth. This is a, uh, a uh, it's called a Wilcox and Gwynn um, planer. And it was made in Ohio. And I had no information on it. I, I got it from a friend of mine. In fact, I met at a, a Nimes um, uh, show. And he came up to me and another youngin at the time and asking whether either one of us wanted a, would be interested in a small planer. And within days, I was up at his place in New Hampshire and he lowered it into the bed of my truck with a with a crane that he had on hand and um, so began your addiction yeah <laughs> I think somebody left it on his doorstep like an orphan puppy you know or <laughs> um, but 
for years I didn't know what it was. There's no name on it. There's no stamping. There's there's some some uh, direction stampings on it to match up A to A and so forth, but really very little information on it. And so I posted about it probably going on 12, 13 years ago. And within a day, I had another example, a partial example, with the, with the name Wilcox and Gwyn. Um, and it was, just the, it was just the frame without a bed and very little of what I, I have here. So I, it probably dates from 1850s in, you know, this was a country shop that made something like this, never mind a, a place that would use something like this, but maybe a, uh, um, it, at one point it had provisions for this, uh, for the flat belt pulleys to run off of a line shaft, and you can see it sits on this stand a little off, it's almost like it was this maybe the stand was from a different machine and they just kind of grafted it on there. Um, but before that, it would be used to, you know, just cranked by hand to take a slice off, you know. Um, maybe a clockmaker or you know, somebody that had to do a little bit of, of, of planing or... You know, I think something's it's not indexing over. I can't imagine doing this all day. <laughs> Enter the machinery. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so it was a real blessing when they figured out how to power by, you know, waterfalls, you know. So this lathe can, it kind of came with its whole uh, system for it. And this is a Worcester made lathe. This is one of the aspects of the transmission. I didn't explain on this, but this is just, it's in neutral now. And this pulley would be for reverse, and that's where you cross the belt in the middle to reverse it. So if I went to there, it's not operating. So I go to here, and that transmits the power to the lathe. I would say a modern lathe for its time, but it was a, a, a fairly well-equipped lathe for the typical workshop, you know. Um, Worcester made, made, had a lot of impact on the early machine tool industry. Um, and this is probably from the 1910 or so, um, or, or 1890s, I should say. Um, had a lot of features, thread stops and compounds and cross feeds, you know. So right now it's feeding ever so slow and taking a, a fine cut on it. You have change gears and um, uh, back gears. So this was a, a uh, kind of became a standard in small lathes like this, you know. I use a lot of different kinds of belting here. I'm just noticing. Um, so there's there's old-fashioned leather. I've discovered that um, leather will take a set, and it'll take a set to its environment that it's in. So all this leather is kind of getting acclimated to how I have it set up and stretched in certain ways. And um, when you remove it, they can go haywire. They can, if, if I'm using a, a belt from, a, from two different pulleys that were, you know, th th I'm using a, a belt from two different pulleys in a mill, I take that belt off and I'm running it on two different pulleys here um, in a different situation with different speeds and stuff, the, the, the leather gets so used to being in its 
um, stretched to its acclimation or whatever, it, beca it, it becomes hard to track them, you know? I've ordered pulleys from, I, I've, I say I, I've ordered belts uh, to be made when they're really big, but I mostly um, put them together myself. And I, I have a stock of leather as well. Um, and there's some more modern type of rubbery plastic type belting there. We have to glue them together. These are, are stapled, so you have a fixture that you use to crush those. Um, and that's good for, you know, butting it end to end. It's a simple cut on, on, the, on the belt. Um, I'd, people always say, oh, yeah, the old flat belt machinery, you hear that clicking going by. And it's really, it, I find it annoying. And, a bit, and if you're using it to your machine, it can actually um, set up a resonance. If you're doing really fine work, that clicking will, will, will set up a pattern in, in your in the piece that you're cutting, you can see that. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> it can have that type of effect. Um, if it's buried up in there, um, it, you know, that, that, that impact is, isn't felt in the main shaft. Um, but what I like to do is I like to uh, uh, splice the belts. So I picked up this machine, and so this is a, a splice here, a splice joint. It's sanded on the, on the top here and on the bottom there. And then you can glue and stitch or just glue um, that together. I picked up this machine at a, at a machinery uh, farm show or something and didn't know what it was. And uh, I thought, oh, it's a little miniature sander for making, you know, little boards or something. Whoop. What it's doing is it's feeding this at an angle in that, against that sanding roll. Now with this, you're cutting off the whole thickness of that belt to begin with. So now it's a lot lighter because it's tapered. And there you have a a uh, splice uh, skiving that joint is what they call it. Um, and what do you use to attach them so that it's a uh, a strong? Yeah, there's a there's a uh, like a contact cement called barge cement is 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 made exactly for that for uh, like. Um, gluing leather and shoes and stuff like that. Um, I found that Gorilla Glue actually works. A polyurethane glue works works quite well. Um, the pro trouble with this is you're locked in there. Once you install it, if there's a, you have to install it in place if it's locked around a pulley and you know within a machine. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a clip, you can just feed it through and. and put the pin between those clips, those, those staples, you know? So that's a, a pin that holds them together. I don't know if you wanna. I have seen that. We yeah. Can, you can look at one. Um, so uh, it, there, there's advantages and disadvantages to, you know, um, depending on what you're doing. I, when I was in college, I, I, I graduated and the one goal that I had in mind for, I think for my whole life, was to make a line shaft shop. I said, I want a line shaft driven shop and someday I'm gonna have that. And uh, it took a while, but um, here it is, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm at a point now where, I, where I'm thinking of, I, I, I run a real shop not just this shop, but um, so I, I actually have to, to, to be economical and, and more productive in a shop that, that this could never allow me to do. So um, as nice it is, as it is having, you know, the sound of the leather belts and the motor and the, the pulleys going around and, and the experience of, of making it uh, and putting it together, 
um, it's just, it, it doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> On a pressing note, I need the electricity that goes up there to now become part of my next utility, which is a, it's not rotational power, but it's a uh, compressed air. So I've got a pretty hefty industrial compressor that I just got in that I need the electricity that feeds that motor to now feed my, my compressed air, which will allow me to be more uh, efficient in here, you know? Um, I much prefer a variable speed DC motor. Boy, they are really nice. Uh, uh, just wonderful things um, versus to get any kind of speed out of a line shaft. You know, it's much more efficient to rely on electricity to, to um, power your equipment. The momentum part is a, is a, is a, you don't get that type of momentum of the whole building, you know, that's keeping all this stuff going, you know, really, it's, it's all that shafting. Um, and th that will never be repeated in, in human history again. I don't think so, <laughs> because it's, like, like I said earlier, you're, you're powering so much of your, your effort is going into just keeping the whole transmission going. Never, and I know, and, and just, I mean, how much power that was to begin with, um, coming off of a, of a river, you know, um, is, is impressive, but kind of inefficient, you know, um, ultimately. I mean, the old equipment, it, it was, it ran at slower speeds, so you would have a hard time getting, uh, you know, most modern metalworking machinery and woodworking machinery for that matter um, relied on high speed and eventually textile equipment relied on on really high speed um, uh, because it does it faster you know and you're using rotary tools and 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 stuff like that um, versus the older stuff like I had said with the uh, the impact of when that cutter going back and forth when it first is introduced to the metal there's a there's a backlash there's a there's an impact that, that it has on the system if you had a motor you know a low horsepower motor powering that it might not make it through that first impact once you get it going yeah fine but it can't take that you know high torque requirement whereas a line shaft it has that momentum built up into it even my little thing here doesn't feel that pulley up there ultimately going back to that motor is not does is not affected by what's going on there you know what i mean this is only a, a, a what a sixth of my shop and the rest of it is all powered by as modern as i can get you know uh electric motors um and that's uh i i would spend half my time maintaining the system you know if i had to to do it this way So uh, th this is the shop um, in, in the, the museum, um, and it has a lot of the same features that my, my shop has, but uh, on, a, on a larger scale. You see, on, on this shop where I'm talking about slowing down the motor, this has a, a significant flywheel up here to kind of uh, take that impact we were, we were talking about. So in here, we have a, uh, uh, a flather lathe here. That's, that's on. And we have a Pratt & Whitney planer back here. Uh, drill press, uh, an old uh, Brown & Sharp milling machine back there. Um, so we're, we're approaching modern age with the, with the milling machine. Um, but this is about the same era of some of the equipment that, that I have in, in my shop. So right now we're we're on we're on neutral on the lathe. We can turn on the 
on the planer here by shifting that sheave up there to a driven pulley. And that's um, planing down this piece of aluminum that we have clamped on there. So um, that again is 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 shifting over and 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 not affected by the impact of that cutter uh, cutting through the. We have uh, a small, an, an older machine shop there that's also belt driven. Um, that's kind of of a of a different era, um, but most of the most of the stuff here came from the. There was a, a paper bag company across the river from here, Waltham Bag and Paper Company, and that was um, that's what this machine does here makes little little paper bags and applies the glue and folds it up and spits them out you know so bob asked me to to bring some some examples or something or some uh things of of what i wanted to show and i brought my sticks because you never know what kind of sticks you're going to need in this type of situation and because it's been a while since this machine shop has been has been run um, you might encounter some some surprises, um, but I also brought. This is what uh, um, kind of surprises me, and I think I mentioned it in the um, in the, the the video of how much you need to 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 install a, a line shaft shop. You almost need a spare line shaft shop to supply you with all the parts and pieces. So, me having collected this stuff from several different mill sites. I always know where to, you know, I, I was fishing around in there and found more of these shells. And these are more modern ones with uh, some uh, um, soft metal bearing material, uh, babbit bearing or is poured into there. So this is probably um, dates those, that, that type of system probably around the, the turn of the century, 1900, 1910 or so. Um, that that would have been this all this stuff would have been in use, um, and I don't know they they probably never ran uh, uh, they they certainly never ran a turbine to power the paper bag f factory, but they probably ran a they could have run a steam engine way back when, um, but maybe most of it was was electric motor powered with a with a big central electric motor that powered that. Todd, you um, built a grist mill model, as I understand it. Yep. Um, and I am, I think we have some uh, videos about that. I took some footage in Landry Park outside the, uh, the museum here. Some of those processes show Oliver Evans in developing that, that kind of uh, system where you bring product up to the, to the attic or the top floor was that that's where he would have been developing the use of, of leather belts and, and attaching buckets to it to make a, a bucket ele elevator where it scoops up the product and, and deposits it, it, it into a hopper or something in, in the, on the top floor of a, of a grist mill. Mm -hmm. When I go on site to make models like this, I, I'll bring sticks, those two sticks that cross stick Every mark on that represents an inch. So I can get this picture home and print it out to scale and use that to help me make my model. So I can, I can print it out to scale and then just measure stuff directly. Like how big is that hopper on top? I just take a ruler and say, that's, that's the scale I want. You know, if I'm using a, uh, you know, uh, inch to the foot or, or, or some type of scale, I can print it out at the scale I need. Fantastic. Um, um, that way I don't need a tape measure when I go to measure these, these sites, you know. So there you can just barely see that that hopper is actually sitting in a in sort of a saddle and it's able to um, kind of vibrate and there's a square peg running in the in the middle of the stones that are tapping against a, a little lever that is, induces a vibration into that hopper. And that allows the product to, to fall through the bottom at a regular rate. 
So it just dislodges anything that's going to stick to the sides of that hopper, making sure it, it makes its way into the, into the stones. So I, I, had to, I started this mill before I moved to Waltham, or I, I should say I signed the contract to make this model for this land trust in Connecticut. Um, but I moved in the meantime, and I had to finish this mill as I was setting up my shop in Waltham, and my customer was like, you know, where is it, where is it? Um, so it was, uh, this was probably a couple days before I delivered it to my customer. Well, it's pretty spectacular. Note that it is using a uh, belt and pulley line shaft system and the Moody Street Dam is in the background. Yeah. So it places it on site as well. Really exquisite work, Todd. The, it's hard to scale things like that, like, like this, because the leather has zero weight to it at this scale. So you don't have that advantage of the weight keeping the, the, the pulley and transmitting that torque. So what I did with these was I, I pre-stretched them and I wet the leather, like really thin leather, and I hung a, hung a weight on them so that they would, all they could do ever do was shrink. Because mm. mm. when, when, when I take the weight off, it's gonna stay at that, um, at that new distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I wrap it around the pulleys, it's only going to shrink from there. It's not gonna get any bigger. Um, and I also, I called it, I, I spiked my pulleys on this little model by inserting a bunch of little pins so that they would um, grip the, the almost, leather. yeah, almost like a brush mm -hmm. um, would, would help to uh, grip those, those really, really super lightweight leather. So was um, spiking an industrial technique or a model maker's technique? It was, a, I, I call it spiking, but uh, it was probably a, a model maker's technique. Yeah. Okay. Um, really in a model this size, you wouldn't use, if you really wanted to make it um, work well, you'd probably use you know, small little uh, round belts and, uh, um, or, or some type of a rubber uh, uh, product for, for your belting, but I wanted to, to I wanted a compromise between real, re using real leather and making it look authentic mm -hmm. and uh, actually making it work, you know. This was the third site that I took some material out of, I think it is. Um, it was a blacksmith shop in, in Southboro. This is not glamorous work, this is real no. work. Hidden away, but it did something meaningful and important in its time. For sure. Yeah, there were real, real craftsmen in that in that shed working at one time, probably in the 1930s or so. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, I dropped a bolt that I was removing some line shaft, and I dropped a bolt, and I came off the ladder. Where's that bolt? You know, I reached under a bureau, and I came out with a. It's called a num number 45 Stanley plane, which is a molding plane, very universal. You know, I'll say high end hand plane for making molding, and so I. Pulled that out. I, I, as soon as I touched it under there, I'm like, I know what that is, and it's <laughs> luckily not a spider bite, you know. All right. We we had a question as to what your website was, and it's steammachinesculpture.com. I did drop it into the chat, yeah. but steam machine with one M in the middle, uh, and um, there are some great examples of his work. Todd yeah. is incredibly uh, skilled. He's artistic. He's versatile. Um, and uh, you did get a, more than a glimpse of his shop, although we didn't really tour it uh, in Toto. There's a whole lot more going on um, that isn't line shaft related. Um, anyway, uh, we are about to okay. call this to a close. I want to wow. thank you very much, Todd, for thank all you. the time and energy you put into this. It was a lot easier um, than I thought it was going to be. I, I really enjoyed <laughs> um, the time in your shop, especially because you um, gave us all really a, a window to the world with a sense of humor about it, um, kind mm -hmm. of a philosophical point of view. And um, I really did uh, get an appreciation for how technologies um, eventually do sunset. And while we've got these belt and pulley line shaft systems here and active, there are fewer and fewer 
uh, places where they're still installed and functioning, and there are fewer and fewer people that uh, know how to do uh, what's necessary to re reclaim and reinstall uh, yeah. that machinery. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, has anything popped into your head, and this is no pressure, but is mm -hmm. there anything you've left unsaid tonight on this um, topic? There's probably plenty, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would, I, I would want to be known as an expert of this because mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. and, and um, um, I, I think that time is probably past for me you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to set up an even more line shafting. Um, mm -hmm. We'll have to figure out a use for all this stuff for something else. I don't know. Um, um, Repurposing. Make, make art out of it. You know? yeah, well, you're pretty good yeah. at that. He's got <laughs> a number of art installations around Boston, yeah. um, large and small. And uh, you, can, you, you, you can also... Yeah, follow me on Instagram, too, under the Steam Machine Sculpture moniker. Everyone, thank you again for joining us. Uh, more Tuesday Tech Talks in the future. The next one's going to be on uh, early vacuum cleaners, of all things. Look for that in mid-December. Um, I think that's a wrap. Thanks very much, and good night. Thank you.